Who invented stuffed animals? The very first dolls in the ancient world were made of hard stuff like wood or clay. But the stuffed animal as we know it today really started with the invention of the rag doll sometime around 2,000 years ago. The oldest rag dolls ever found were stuffed with rags, papyrus, or hay, and usually woven with colorful string and trinkets like beads. Over the next thousand some odd years, rag dolls remained a super popular toy for kids around the world in different cultures and classes. Eventually, in the early 1800s, the Industrial Revolution started in England, and before long, rag dolls went from being handmade to mass produced in factories, just like tons of other toys and products. Innovations but the ability to print colorful or patterned fabrics allowed companies to manufacture dolls that were super vibrant and super quick to make. Okay, so that's how ancient wooden dolls morphed into soft and squishy rag dolls, but when did the stuffed animal come along? When did stuffed dolls give way to stuffed animals like the teddy bear? Well, it started in the late 1800s when a German woman named Margaret Steiff invented the very first known stuffed animal, an adorable little elephant that was meant to be a pincushion. But a couple years later, Marguerite's nephew Richard took her idea and turned it into a toy for kids. A stuffed bear! Their newfangled doll hit stores just a few years later in 1902. Around the same time, a Russian immigrant named Morris Mictum, living across the Atlantic in the United States, came up with his own design for a stuffed bear toy. Mr. Mictum based his design on a famous cartoon he saw in the newspaper. The drawing shows President Teddy Roosevelt out on a bear hunt with a group of his pals. Roosevelt was known as an avid hunter, but just didn't feel right striking down a defenseless animal, so he told his men to let the bear go free. Artists made the bear in the cartoon look adorable, and Morris Mictum knew it had to be a toy. He sent a prototype of his inspired invention to Teddy Roosevelt himself and got the president's permission to use his nickname on the toy. And just like that, the legend of the teddy bear was born. Both versions of the teddy bear were an instant smash success in Europe and the US. So whether your favorite stuffed animal is a bear, a bird, a badger, or any other kind of creature, you can thank the good old teddy bear and the president who inspired it for your fluffy friend. Who invented superheroes? You might be surprised to learn that superheroes have been around a lot longer than you think. Stories of superheroes are so old that we've been telling them for as long as we've been telling stories. You can find them across all cultures all around the world. Some people like to call Gilgamesh the first superhero. The Epic of Gilgamesh is an ancient story about a king named Gilgamesh who was two-thirds god and one-third human. He regularly rescued people in need and fought monsters that could raise the dead on his epic journey to find the key to everlasting life. Sounds a lot like a superhero, huh? And Gilgamesh wasn't the only ancient superhero. In Scandinavia, Beowulf was the superhero of choice. In the epic story, he saves the people of Denmark from a monster, then another scarier monster, then even has to come back as an old man to defeat a giant dragon. Okay, so those are our ancient superheroes, but what about our more modern costumed cape crusaders? Robin Hood is one of the first folk heroes to be known for his distinctive costume and weapon of choice. Just like any good superhero, Robin Hood has an arch nemesis in the Sheriff of Nottingham, his team of allies called the Merry Men, and his one true love in Maid Marian. Ancient and medieval heroes like Beowulf and Robin Hood were inspiration for characters like Popeye and Zorro in the 1920s. Comic book writers in the 1930s started to combine the costume characters with the ones that had superpowers and finally started creating some of our favorite superheroes today like Superman. Ever since then, hundreds of iconic heroes have been invented, reinvented, killed, resurrected, turned evil, time traveled, redeemed, crossed universes, killed again, and resurrected again. 
Who invented gum? Chewing gum is nothing new. In fact, it's at least 6,000 years old. The oldest wad of ancient chewed up gum ever unearthed was found in Finland and even included teeth marks. Ancient gums were made from local plants, like birch bark tar used for Finland's wad. The Greeks would chew mastic tree bark, the Chinese used ginseng roots, and the Mayans chewed chicle, which comes from the sapodilla tree. Cocoa leaves, nuts, and even blubber have all been used as forms of chewing gum in the past, too. But the modern gum we know and love today really traces its roots to the U.S. The First Nations people living in North America chewed their own form of gum made from the sap of spruce trees. And before long, European settlers across New England began chewing on the stuff too. As demand grew, the very first commercial chewing gum, called the State of Maine Pure Spruce Gum, was sold in 1848. Wrigley's gum hit shelves in 1892, and Chicklets came along seven years later in 1899. Modern chewing gum finally gained massive worldwide popularity following the Second World War. American soldiers were given a ration of chewing gum as part of their food supplies and would often trade sticks with locals, spreading modern gum around the globe. After the war, chewing gum only got more popular and a cheaper modern version was invented. Although some gums today still use plants, most recipes today now use synthetic rubber mixed with sugar and other flavorings. And believe it or not, it can actually be healthy for you to occasionally chew some gum. You see, chewing causes your mouth to produce more saliva, which helps keep your teeth clean and safer from bacteria. So next time you're blowing bubbles in the back of class and the teacher tells you to throw it away, just say it's all a part of your dental hygiene. Let's <laughs> see how that goes. Who invented toys? Kids have played games as far back as we can trace, but the earliest toys were a little different than the ones you've got today. Through most of time, kids have made toys out of anything they can find, like sticks, rocks, clay, whatever. But man-made toys have been found from ancient civilizations all around Earth. In India, experts have excavated toys that are more than 4,500 years old. Clay animal figurines on wheels, small carts, bird-shaped whistles, and toy monkeys that could slide on a string. Many of the world's most classic toys came from ancient China. The kite was invented there and was super popular at least 3,000 years ago. The Chinese also invented another all-time toy. The yo-yo! These ancient yo-yos were made from wood, metal, or painted terracotta clay. Ancient Egyptian children even had dolls with wigs and movable limbs. In ancient Greece and Rome, kids also played with dolls, yo-yos, balls, wooden swords, bows, and little figurines. And get this, when Greek kids became adults, it was tradition to burn all their favorite childhood toys in a sacrifice to the Greek gods. So who invented toys? It's impossible to say for sure, but we do know that a small set of toys have been around just about as long as humans. So the next time your yo-yo string gets knotted up and ruined, just remember, it's a tale as old as time. Who invented emojis? Let's start with the basics. An emoji is different from an emoticon. Emoticons are pictures made out of normal keyboard characters, while emojis are actual pictures. The fact that the word emoji kind of sounds like emotion is just a coincidence. The word actually comes from the Japanese word for picture, e, and character, moji. That's because they were invented in Japan by a man named Shigakata Kurita all the way back in 1998. He was working for a company that was on the cutting edge of texting technology at the time, but since it was 1998, that meant there was only enough computing character to send 250 characters per message. This got Shigakata Kurita thinking, 
What if we use single character pictures instead of words? That would allow people to write longer messages without bumping up against the character limits. His very first collection of emojis had 176 simple, small, pixelated images of all sorts of basic everyday things like hearts, moods, weather, food, and entertainment. Right away, emojis were a major success in Japan and quickly became a regular part of communication. But it would take a few more years before this new Japanese texting trend would make its way to other parts of the world. Emojis took off in the United States mostly because they were included on Apple's brand new iPhone back in 2007. Since smartphones became the must-have device, millions of Americans all discovered emojis at the same time. And just like that, no text, tweet, or comment section was ever the same. Who invented the guitar? The exact origin of the guitar is a bit of a mystery, but its history is a bit easier to track. Guitar-like stringed instruments have been around since at least ancient times and possibly even longer. The oldest known guitar-like instruments are at least 4,000 years old and come from ancient Egypt. They're called bull harps, and they were made of a tortoise shell, a bent wooden stick for the neck, and silk strings. By the time the Greeks rolled around a few thousand years later, they had invented their own version of the bull harp called a kithara, which is likely where the word guitar first comes from. A katara had a square wooden body and two arms coming off the sides connected by a crossbar. It could have as many as 12 strings and was even played using an early version of a guitar pick and strapped over the shoulder like a modern guitar. From there, the katara evolved into two different types of guitar-like instruments, the oud in the Arabian Peninsula and its descendant, the lute, in Europe. The oud had 10 to 12 strings no frets, and a skinnier neck. Lutes started with between 15 and 24 strings, but as time passed, they got even more complex, often having up to 30 strings. Imagine if Barb and her band of hard rock trolls had to get their hands on 30 strings instead of just six. Eventually, around the time of the Renaissance, musicians in Europe lost interest in lutes, and started using instruments with a curved shape that looked a bit more like a guitar. It's called a Baroque guitar, and by the start of the 1700s, it had all but replaced the lute across Spain and the rest of Western Europe. Guitars finally took their more modern form in the mid-1800s, when a Spanish musician named Antonio de Torres Huardo built himself a new style of guitar that we'd recognize as a guitar today. His subtle improvements on the design gave guitars their unique, full-bodied sound that they're now known for. Around the turn of the century, as the music industry began to take off, bands and record execs were looking for ways to make their guitars louder and louder. So, intrepid inventors began designing guitars that could be electrically amplified. By the 1950s, these new electric guitars were common in American music, and before too long, the guitar became the iconic instrument we know and love today. Remember that next time you're rocking out. Who invented skiing? Skiing is one of the most popular winter activities today, and also maybe one of the oldest. No one can say quite how long people have been skiing, but it's clearly been a long time. In northwest China, 5,000-year-old rock paintings show people on skis sliding around, and the oldest known skis ever on Earth are from northern Russia and at least 7,000 years old. But most experts think people have been skiing even longer than that. These are just the oldest artifacts we've found. In fact, some think that skiing might have even been invented before the wheel. Back in those days, skiing wasn't just something people did for fun on a snowy weekend. It was a way for people to get around much easier and faster in the snow. Skiing was also a great way to hunt and even helped Nordic people like the Vikings move their heavy ships over land. There's also a long history of people skiing into battle from at least 800 years ago until at least World War II. 
Okay, so skiing has been around for a long time, but when did it become a popular pastime rather than just a useful mode of transportation? Well, that was much more recently. You see, skiing took a long time to catch on as a mainstream sport because, well, it was a lot of work. Skiers had to hike all the way to the top of the mountain before skiing down. That meant that even the best climbers could only ski for a few runs per day, making downhill skiing more of a fringe sport for mountaineers. But all that changed in the 1930s, when several newfangled inventions were introduced to try and solve the problem. First, simple tow ropes pulled people up. Then along came the chairlift, followed by the gondola for longer trips that take you higher up the mountain. Now that skiers didn't need to huff it up the hill to hit the slopes, all sorts of new people could try it for the first time. The next big jump in popularity came in the 1950s, when ski events first started to be shown on TV, introducing the sport to people all around the globe. Snowy ski resorts started popping up in mountainous, cold-weather countries all over the world, and just like that, skiing finally became the worldwide winter activity that we all know today. So, who invented skiing? Who knows? One thing's for sure, though. Whoever did invent it all those years ago, they definitely knew how to have fun, whether they realized it or not. Who invented comic books? It might seem like comic books are a modern marvel, but it turns out they trace their origins farther back than you might expect. The very first comic book ever printed was published in Europe back in 1837. Scholars say the comic book was called The Adventures of Obadiah Oldbuck, written by a Swiss author named Rudolf Topfer. It looked more like a picture book than what we think of as a classic comic, yet it's widely credited with paving the way for newspaper strips and comics, which followed in its footsteps. Comic books didn't make their way to the United States until 1933. The first one was called Funnies on Parade, and it was made up entirely of reprinted newspaper comic strips of the day. It proved popular and quickly led to the publication of other newspaper comic strips in book form. As interest and demand from the public grew and grew, writers and artists started inventing characters to star in these newly popular comic books. In 1938, the golden age of comic books officially began after two friends named Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster created a new character called Superman in Action Comics number one. The popularity of Superman made the superhero the defining genre of American comic books. And other heroes soon followed. Batman debuted a year later in a 1939 issue of Detective Comics. The Flash dashed onto the scene in 1940, and Captain America, Aquaman, and Wonder Woman all joined the superhero ranks in 1941. But by the start of the 1950s, interest in superhero comic books started to decline. TV had just been invented, and people were shifting in droves from reading books and comics to watching TV instead. But by the 1960s and 70s, a new wave of superhero interest, called the Silver Age of comic books, swept the nation, and we've never really looked back since. Today, it's hard to imagine a movie theater or toy store not chock full of movies and toys about superheroes. And one thing seems for certain, comic book superheroes are here to stay. <laughs>